the uh, uh, renga is a Japanese uh, syllabic collaborative poetry form. Um, the I, th I think perhaps the syllabic as aspect is less interesting uh, than the fact that uh, uh, the there are all uh, short poems, or I think it is 14 lines, but very few syllables per line, uh, but that uh, each writer uh, picks up a word in the last line of the, of the record, of the tanka that the, uh, 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 that, that uh, her, his collaborator um, has written and starts another, uh, and starts another poem with that. Uh, they do not have to be related in any way other than being linked by those words. And uh, although, although they uh, some, some, sometimes are more than not. And uh, uh, Kartika and I wrote this uh, during the confinement. Uh, we don't live all that far from one another, and, um, but uh, we couldn't see each other, or well, we didn't see each other all but once. Uh, during the, uh, during the time that we, that we wrote this uh, that we wrote this and uh, otherwise it was all written on email and uh, uh, during uh, during during the Paris lockdown and uh, I know for me just look wait, op opening up the computer to, to seeing if there was one of those emails from Kartika and if there was it was truly a high point of the day. <laughs> Thank you. And Renga are, you know, usually do reference the seasons. For us, it was uh, the changing seasons of the pandemic. We wrote it between 29th, what is in the book. So there were a few, few poems written after, but very few. But what's written in the book is the 367 days starting from 29th of March 2020, all the way to the 31st of March 2021. And um, yeah, they were, I mean, Brandon said they were a high point. They were a sanity saver for me um, because I was, it was also a year that I was going through chemo and surgery and radiation. And this was the one, you know, the one kind of space I had to be outside the body. We, we, we unfortunately need it for our Zoom audience. Sorry? Oh, oh. The, the Zoom audience can't hear without the microphone, unfortunately. Um. One desert window. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, is that, or that is what she did. Four o'clock sunshine on this day. The bookshop, the beehive, Kartika is here, and I'm here. First time we've met since January. In a room above the river, we record for the Bengaluru Festival, she can't attend. Then we sit at times with hot chocolate, black coffee. She takes off the mauve silk scarf on her head and lets the sun cool the sky. She's a householder of Rome. Doubly, the teasing, the banter, the laughter. Sweet nothings we had grown unused to, locked down all these months. This reading, recording first, with Marilyn and Adam and an unseen pianist upstairs at Shakespeare and Company. My favorite Wednesday this year. Then a slew of Rutkhuvai, its English sibling, feeble, all week, spotlit by the same sun and often hot chocolate. 31st July 2020. Foot hot at its brace for a stupid broken bone propped on a cushion. I'm back and forth on WhatsApp for six hours. Two explosions on the port, half of their roof blown up. Gemaize, Bush Hamoud. We're safe, in shock, the windows shattered. 
war zone cell phone videos. The bride in white lace hijab blown down in her gown is a doctor who was in, e in an ER six hours later triaging stretchers. The triage stretches through the night on Koyukod Airport's tarmac, then in ERs of hospitals across two neighboring towns. Volunteers battling manic rains and a raging virus seek voices between the debris of 190 lives fleeing COVID-19 from Dubai, 18 dead and 120 injured. Ama, were there people you... She replies, they were all someone's blood, child. 9th August, 2020. Someone's child, someone's uncle, sister, son. Were they blasted, infected? The disasters converge while Katya sends me a WhatsApp photo, bottle of white wine I left in the fridge on Macdisi Street. I've packed your books and clothes. We'll drink the wine when you come back. When you come next, we'll drink a beaker of sunset by Valiani Lake. Then his voice clouds. That won't be likely this year, will it? Buoyant since birth, my dad held on to hope all these months. A surefire cure, tests, vaccines. His belief now flags after the morning news. 23rd August, 2020. No more rainbow flags. Le Mo à la Bouche bookshop has been replaced by another Doc Martens store and the Moroccan grocer by Princess Tam Tam underwear, one of three clones in 10 blocks. I don't want to walk down the Rue Saint-Croix de la Bretonnerie where sometimes I go near midnight and browse, come home with that new novel by Nina Borawi and grapefruit juice for the morning. Grief stains the morning like grape overripe the tongue. Purple, glutinous. Grief stains their voices. Achen and Amma live, relive, loss each time I call. Three deaths in two days. Old, dear friends, 40 and 60 year old kinships, their markers of being. Grief edged by new enforced distance, by the lack of touch, of last rites. Grief clogs till Swarup YouTube streams a funeral. Life seeps back into their cords. 31st August 2020. Who'll get their life back? Although no one ever does. Iva says the last trip she took was seven months ago to a friend's wedding, classmate from med school. And no one's come to their house since February, though the big garden's in bloom. You're the risk factor, I tease. Nights in the ER. It's two years now since I've seen her. Beirut, night shifts, now pandemic intimacies. WhatsApp, FaceTime, telephone for September 2020. The old telephone holds Larbi's voice, which holds me gently. As he says, Ron is no more. The end was sudden. We thought, like him, cure was a real word. So is relapse, we learn. Ron, wind beneath many wings. Our own counter cliche the finance pro who loved dance. His eyes shimmied when he spoke of performances watched with you. Gosh, my words to Marcel, Ron's husband, who brings me comfort instead. 8th September, 2020. Instead of teaching online in the ruins of Beirut, 
Rana flew to Norway with her two kids, back to her fourth language, their school days, her research. Abu Rana and his group of leftist Thu'ar are on the street every night, masked in the late summer heat, clearing rubble in Gemaize, whose tragedies a year ago were lovers leaving or leases with exorbitant new rent. 11 September, 2020. Exorbitant new fears raise Ravan heads everywhere. Why for first place in the mouths of ministers and media? We make room for separatisme and then en sauvagement. My parents taste urban nuxo. Should I tell them that is bug speak for folks like me? 17 September, 2020. Devotee of do nothing, the minister does. In one another's arms, faces, masks on chins, wrists, the young crowd late summer streets, drinking Cokes or beer, eating sandwiches. I wish this were fine. I'd like to mind my own business, read film reviews, not virus charts. 18th September, 2020. I read film reviews, famished for the cinema, land unvisited since March, and theater, word that makes me weep, patria, no less, touchable only during virtual meetings, rehearsals recorded and transferred uh, new terms that yield bread, though not quite butter. Shambling home from hospital, I watch hounds, pugs, mutts, and pups raise happy cane by the K. Enfin, a show safe for all. 22nd September, 2020. For all the good it does, the mayors say, stay safe with no restrictions. It's your fault if you're fat, old, diabetic, asthmatic, or having chemo. Stay indoors. We'll keep the bars, gyms, playgrounds open. It's fall. It started raining. And the river says elsewhere. 28th September, 2020. Rivers of sunlight flood Joelle's studio. Much like faces, voices, fill her screen from Bangalore, Delhi, Dhaka, Kolkata. All gathered to fet. 80 years of Alliance Francaise du Bengal. And Jay and I, with Demon Tiger and Forest Goddess, joined the party from Ivry. Through verb and line, curve, morpheme in three tongues. The Shunderbans fill our maskless minds. And laughter, our years. 28th September, 2020. Musical round of applause. Thank you. Thank you both for such a wonderful reading. I have to say, having read the book, which if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to purchase it. It makes such an incredible difference to hear both of your voices speaking this aloud. Um, and this is something we'll talk about is the relationship between poetry and orality and performance. Um, but it's really remarkable to see the conversation happen in real time as you see it on the page as well. Um, so thank you for that. That was really special. Um, I think now we're going to follow this with a reading of selections from calligraphies by Matt. Marilyn, you'll be following this with a reading from calligraphy. <laughs> and perhaps before we begin this, you could explain how calligraphies came as a project after the completion of A Different Distance. Oh, I'm sorry. If you could, if you could explain to us how calligraphies came about, how it followed a different distance. In rainbow form made up of tassel in the in the book, which I'm not going to read because I think we've heard. We've had enough. Yeah. <laughs> 
But so you wrote this uh, after COVID or after the initial confinement? Mm, lovely. I'll, I'll try reading sitting down because it's good. Um, museum piece. This is this was written in Beirut, and, and the and the museum is a little museum on the campus of the American University in Beirut, which was always empty and was full of wonderful things. Once Phoenician triremes stood in harbor, poised for merchant journeys of exploration. Honey wine, gems, dyes for a purple tunic, scarabs and daggers. There were artifacts in the small museum on the campus nobody ever came to. Goddess statues, bracelets, rings, swords, toy wagons, Tadmor tomb portraits, lively saddened faces, a bit of makeup, a clay hippopotamus painted azure, toy or minor deity. The explosion undid curator's care as it did doctors, grandfathers, mothers. But the feral cats who survived as always bask in light millennial, the debris of August around them. This is a puzzle, and I, I won't go into it long, I should make another puzzle, but uh, uh, it's that started uh, with a project by Inu Archives, which I will not try to read in Arabic, because it's not the Inu Archives, uh, uh, that uh, it means, what a night when the stars came down to the, to the death rock by Cordy Brennan. A line of salt, like a linen thread, is wound to the rock. Wave break, boy singing, gunfire, make no sound to the rock. If God blessed vegetation, fish and birds, then humans, did she get around to the rocks? Shout your rage in the din of seaside traffic. Whisper the thought you thought was so profound to the rocks. They dug a tunnel to go under the border. Why did it only lead them underground to the rocks? Dog-like, the waves bring the cadaver of one more boy from a rubber boat who drowned to the rocks. The specter of an old woman comes striding, haggard and magnificently gowned to the rocks. At ritual's end, someone is carried stark naked or caparisoned and crowned to the rocks. Andromeda became a constellation, but princess, even the stars tonight are bound to the rocks. This is a poem to, that is dedicated to the Yusendi Syrian poet and activist and author and son of the Islamicist Leo Chavez, who died in the Syrian in Nepal in 2017. But she was a white man. Said the old woman who barely speaks the language. Freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose. Said the insurgent, who is now in exile. 
when I began to write the story, I started bleeding. Freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose. That man I last saw speaking in front of the clock tower when I began to write the story. I started bleeding five years after I knew I'd have no more children. That man I last saw speaking in front of the clock tower turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. Five years after I knew I'd have no more children, my oldest son was called up for the army, turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. My nephew, my best friend, my second sister, whose oldest son was called up for the army, are looking for work now in other countries. Her nephew, his best friend, his younger sister, a doctor, an actress, an engineer, are looking for work now in other countries, stumbling, disillusioned in a new language. A doctor, an actress, an engineer, wrestle with the rudiments of grammar, disillusioned, stumbling in a new language, hating their luck and knowing they are lucky. Wrestling with the rudiments of grammar, the old woman who barely speaks the language hated her luck. I know that I am lucky, said the insurgent, who is now in exile. And I think I will just read this from a new sequence from Hala Sasuki. I just realized. <clears throat> and thank you all for sitting here and listening with me. And uh, Leonor de Montaigne was the daughter of Michelle de Montaigne. <laughs> I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> and the, the, Marie, the Marie to whom I uh, refer uh, is the poet Marie Ponceau, uh, 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 an Amer a great American poet who lived uh, quite a bit of her life in France and uh, uh, was thoroughly, but thoroughly at home in both languages. <clears throat> and um, who remembers Leonor de Montaigne, an unloan, an unloved only child, merely a daughter? Her unloved mother, women servants, taught her manners and household matters to be clean, how to cook, and one would hope to garden. A governess, perhaps, no Latin tutor, no fencing, equitation, no world tour. The, the essay on educating well-born men her father wrote stipulated all these. And who remembers Jacqueline Pascal, whose father taught her everything her brother learned? Church writings only, poetry's too worldly, though she could word a miracle. Marie, uncloistered, always remembered her. Marie, uncloistered, always remembered her months in the convent when to fast, pray, and meditate alone brought her such joy she almost starved. A mother superior or priest opined that the exterior life might be her designated way with Latin, French, a graduate degree at 24 and just after the war. Then steerage class to France within her means, the battlefield detritus that she sorted, the chapels, river, and the coup de foudre. Then seven children living on rice and beans, 20 odd F stops, 20 odd F train stops into Queens, a life whose sense was purposeful disorder. 
how prayerful sometimes total disorder seems. I have dismembered my life and am on my knees in the wind in the half dark on prickly grasses on the border between summer and fall. I hear discord, or is it only the wind that seems to laugh at everything? I took a photograph of the street and one of the front door, direction unknown, toward the square, the road away. Metaphoric knees, but real confusion. I think of talking about it with Marie. I have to remind myself again she's gone. The hills are there, implacable blue sky. The street is there and leaving and leading out of town. The street is there and leaving out of town or on a heat wave Tuesday, driving back from the vast supermarket in Gignac, laden with yogurt, paper towels, brown eggs in the fire of early afternoon. The squares like the aftermath of an attack. That man sprawled on a bench could be in shock. I remember a poem by Josephine Jacobson where hell is a Mexico City parking lot past noon and there's no place left in the shade. A stray dog stretched out under the arcade, sand colored, va vaguely wolfish, no named breed. Entropy spreads like oil. The concrete's hot. The man, the dog are breathing. They aren't dead. The man, the dog are breathing. They aren't dead, just stoned unconscious by the canicule. Somewhere, a waterfall, a mountain pool, a path shaded by conifers that led into a clearing, still breezy, ahead of midday heat the estival misrule of what's misheard, mistranslated. A minuscule vowel shift can shift everything. Your bedmate, your next meal, what your window looks out on in first morning, reflects it back for you to comp contemplate, thinking of books you've read or haven't read or stopped reading. Whose are the words that I don't know I'm needing as the page after the last page goes black? The, the page after the last page shifts to black, then back to white, another empty screen, a probable imaginary scene projected there, an embrace, an attack, or an omission. Get over your knack for melodrama. The dog's got his own home. He's at the window. It's, war it's wrought iron balcony beside his person, the attractive crop-haired ceramicist who has a shop downstairs opposite the grocery sidewall where the road to Le Barry begins. Down at the base, the hiking trail to the abandoned castle starts. I stop there, turn back, breathing hard, breathing hard up the hill. I turn back, breathing hard, went up the hill to my afternoon attic of books, notebooks, devices, distractions, in the nooks of the couch, on lean, out on the terrace, filling the freezer. Then the heat wave fell like a migraine, a lead curtain, like rebukes from a friend when friendship ends. Jay smokes in the armchair where earlier in still cool morning, I drank coffee, all shutters drawn against the sun. Upstairs, the ceiling fan hums, the only noise. Claim peace, regain cloistered silence that's not a rented room no one else enters. That's the hope that that's the hope for rain, an essay by Leonardo de Montaigne. Thank you. There's never apologize for, for lots of poetry. Thank you so much um, for those readings, Marilyn. And it's so special to hear such a range of um, your poetic works as well. And we will be discussing in depth, um, but first we have one more person who will be reading tonight. Uh, so Kartika is going to be reading for us. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with her work, a lot of it is of a very visual nature. And so um, one of the poems, two of the poems she's going to read 
require um, to be seen in order to fully understand them. So we will be displaying them behind us uh, on the screen as well. Um, well, um, the the one on you know the metro is primarily because it's also being illustrated um, by Roshni Vyam, a young brilliant artist. We've uh, Bombay-based poet Sampurna Chatterjee and I wrote an entire book about the the railway systems, the local railway systems in our city. So I wrote about the metro, and she wrote about the Mumbai local. And then we had this huge stroke of luck that we got to work with two visual artists, Joel Jolie with whom I've been working on children's books, and Roshni Vyam. And the gaze changed. So um, we had written about our own cities. Joel went over to Bombay, um, as it used to be called, and rode the Mumbai local with Sampurna and then you know illustrated in real time, which is what she does. She draws while um, she's in that particular space. And Roshni, whose uh, illustrations uh, draw from Gond art and are much more um, symbolic, rode the metro with me, went back and then drew these, which both um, talk about the narrative of the poem and also the sights that she'd seen in the metro. So to start with one um, of those poems. This is called Line Five, The Last Duet. Stalingrad, en route to 8 a.m. There'd seldom be much space for hearts to settle or stay. Forty pairs or so of feet would fidget, fence, lurch and trip through Gare de l'Est, République and Oberkampf. By Bastille, he'd begun to sip newsprint, Le Monde, or its weakened supplement, and dream shot half clad lips, turn by turn. One with relish. And you, you'd listened, years wrapped in France Inter, listened through stations, crowds, and kisses to Bernard Marie's cross words with Dominique Sir, like on any other Friday. Listened to Marie's slam greed and growth unbridled, Sir untangle cutbacks, layoffs, the endless spiral of state thrift and both seek a gentler realm for earthlings. Listen till compoformio to crucial, affable debate. Listen, unknowing this would be their last duet, unsullied by grief, horror, the end of nameless freedoms, another kind of unbeing. Did we have a PDF of that page? Uh, so, yeah, uh, the, the, the previous one. Could we just see the previous one for a minute? So that's Roshni's illustration of the poem. And as is often the case with contemporary Gondart, uh, she uses animals. So that's a cockerel, which is what she used to speak about early morning. And then if you look closely, those two birds are actually a radio set. And you can see a bit of Le Monde. And then there's all the stations between the feathers. She's just really brilliant. We were very lucky. Um, On to something a little happier, even though it was kind of written as a scold. This one's really fun. And it's a sneak peek for our event tomorrow as well, not to spoil anything. So this one's called, uh, it's only an excerpt because it's a very long poem. So I'm just reading an excerpt. Be uh, to Roger Cohen, further to his Paris dispatch of January 30, 2021 in the New York Times. Or alternate title, alternative title, this last year in Cadavrex Key, a few things to be found in Paris. I love you, Roger Cohen, but you know nothing. We still have Paris. We'll always have Paris. And of course, until, of course, Paris decides otherwise, which it could, for Paris has a mind of its own, an often ornery one, and cares little for what you or I might want or demand it to be. You said, its lifeblood is cut off. Yes. You said, its nights are silenced. Yes. You said, dinner arrives earlier, and went on to add an abominable Americanization. Yes. 
Gone are the museums, you said. Yes. Gone the tourist-filled riverboats plying the Seine, you said. Yes. Gone the sidewalk terraces. Yes. You said, even the bisou, the little kiss on both cheeks that is a rite of greeting or farewell, is gone. Yes, and yes. Paris is gone for now, you said. No, Roger. May I call you Roger? Actually, Mr. Cohen will do as well. It is rare metrical poise. No, let's disagree there. Paris is not gone. But perhaps, Mr. Cohen, to paraphrase a very dear writer, confrère, we occupy different worlds, you and I. You said you had returned mm, nine weeks ago now? Let me take you, Mr. Cohen, around Paris through 52, the last 52 weeks. We'll start here at the Parc de la Villette. At the cusp of the northeastern curve of town, the ancient abattoirs, home. Home now, home, sorry. Home now to La Zenith, La Geode, Le Trabendo, L'Argonaute, Le Cabaret Sauvage, La Grande Halle, L'Espace Chapiteau, la, la Philharmonie de Paris. Names that soar like an incantation. And several kin, museums, theaters, concert halls, conservatories, submarines, arenas, and more. Home also to the eight regal lions of Nubia designed by Pierre Simon Girard two centuries or so ago. Lions that crouch in wait, spewing neither fire nor ice nor aquapura for the moment, but beholding everything. The change in skies, seasons, presidents, pandemics, populations, art and artists. The oldest immigrants here, indentured from Place du Château d'Eau, uh, that we humans now call Place de la République, back in 1867 when the abattoirs were birthed for the business of killing. The lions never blink, Mr. Cohen. They didn't when the Villette stood up for a gravely unwell immigrant intern 20 years back. When it performed virtuosic legal somersaults that would have done its aerialist proud, all to keep her in France. And they haven't blinked to see her immigrant fire dragon movement maker, Flemish Moroccan, and child of Hoboken, the original Hoboken, Belgian Hoboken, rule the marquee every year these last 10 years. But their eyes gleam in pride when the letters of his name go up the facade of the Grand Dual. Sidi, Larbi, Sherkawi. They gleam in pride when children troop in, many among them children of exile, of uprootedness. Children troop in to watch in delight, in wonder, not just the movement, but the maker's name, cousins, sometimes to their own. And then one of them whispers, I could do that too when I grow up. And then wonder, gets threaded with possibility. The gleam in the lion's eyes could be mere reflected shivers from the red LED. Maybe, and maybe not. What we do know, the lions remain. They wait, they watch, even in winter. There are no viewers in the Grand Val at the Villette, but artists, enablers, technicians, still design, rehearse, deliver, in schools. They take their art, pared down, snack-sized, to children. Not perfect, but not gone either. And for those who uh, have not understood the relevance of that, um, you should check our program's calendar because we will be having Mr. Roger Cohen in person tomorrow. Um, so there is a nice bit of meta dialogue happening there between speakers tonight and speakers tomorrow. And in fact, 
you sent this poem to Roger Cohen uh, and, and he responded to it, is that correct? Yes, thanks to Mira Kamdar who's here and who put me in touch with him. Um, they're colleagues, they were colleagues. And um, he replied and he sent me a very sweet sort of halfway between a tanka and a haiku kind of a poem back. Um, so she's which, made a poet of, of the New York Times Paris bureau chief. That's an achievement in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet and generous. So, mm -hmm. um, And a last poem. Actually, we have the other pages to the And you'll see why I didn't read all of it, because it is really very, very long. Oh, you don't have the other pages? OK. No worries. It's about six pages long. And it goes through uh, northeastern Paris, basically, down the Canal Saint Martin, all the way to Saint Louis. So, this last one is called Remaindering Habits, and it's part of a series of poems called Habits. St. Andrews, Forbach, Gothenburg, Set. Doué, Roubaix, the towns we knew as shapes at night, or a stranger in the next birth, half hidden beneath a duvet. A whirling midnight of bo boat hopping in Nantes, half of Lyon from 2001. All the mornings Julianed into sunshine and periwinkle skies at Croix Rousse. Sunday ends at La Cigale, or was it La Fourmi, or both? Redolent of the ashes and smoke and crimson drapes of Wong Kar Wai. The salad bowl tossing an ever delayed sunrise over your cracked skylight. Those seven to three lines, 563 words, you managed to fit alongside eternity on an unpostmarked card. Some constellations, Aquarius, Aries, Hydra, Pegasus, the blue and canary yellow polka dotted python who still gobbles me up on the 99th square. A weekend in Rouen where I drank the sun with a red plastic straw. Dimples on your stubble left cheek that surfaced from a dream at 5 a.m. alone. I wonder at their constancy. Your hands wrapped around my fugitive breath even through those dreams. The sight of a baby in the metro who looked like she could be ours, and my relief, she was not. <laughs> the July afternoon, the sun left the map of Spain on a thigh. The year I turned cartographer at beachside siestas, mapping the stir of sand across your back, the blue, the blue rivulets under your skin navigating their way towards a heartbeat the giant prismatic poster of Mira Naya's monsoon wedding covering fissures on a kitchen wall, two wickerwork laundry baskets from Dinjan, wooden ladles now splintered, that livid indigo hand braided quilt, the first among joint possessions. 12 hour road trips across France under unwashed stars to help resettle schoolmates piles of moldy Satyajitre VHS tapes, a map of free Bangladesh, the Maori mask gifted by a fellow passenger on the train from Georgetown, knots and crosses played on the rafters of a hotel ceiling. Every yesterday but the second, quieter than the first, yet more fragrant. Keep them and stay, yes. They're yours from today. What will I take instead, you ask? Solenoid, Uroburos, and African pile, words we learn from each other. Sputters of laughter over the misspelling of recipiendaire in my 120 page dissertation you went on to supervise. A first date with Patricia Rowe's intimacy that left us bereft of voice, but not touch. The spring lost in Paris and retrieved in Rome, neonate, but blight and loud. Then boss and its soundless mornings where even birds meditate. Dublin, yes, despite the disasters with missing Kathak bells and Katana. 
those shy cities that blush at dusk when the sun's gaze fills with sudden desire, others undressed by moonlight. The unsubsidized, incomplete report, science and the art of rolling balls and other machines. All the lines of poetry you thought and refused to write. The crackle and splutter of toast burning before breakfast. A tuneless humming muffled by shower curtains. Matinal half light, half hour radio switch battles between RFI and BBC World. Sighting the smile on a natal cleft as you reach up for the tin of dark chocolate. Harun and the Sea of Stories and Invisible Cities. More mine than yours. Yes, I can play dirty on this. Canal Saint Martin, but only the curve between the Cafe, Le Valmy, and Pont de la Grande Jobelle. Kudiatum as a birthday surprise when the gods left their paddy fields and invaded Paris, complete with cobalt and emerald cheeks, human woes and joys. The first encounter with Pina Bausch's Rite of Spring. Oh, Cafe Miller. Every single one with her Rite of Spring. My fear of dying alone in a strange city at night. Copper and caramel. The two shades your gaze seems to traverse between dusk and daybreak. Other constellations, Pisces and Lynx and Phoenix, that the ancient fleece jacket each would wear when the other was not around. All of Terry Pratchett's Discworld books we own together. The word together as well. The fact you shared aloud in surprise at tea, a giraffe's heart, weighs an incredible 24 pounds. Today, tomorrow, a spring tide of tomorrows. That's a lovely line to end that on. Thank you so much. Um, how special to be able to hear both of you speaking your poetry aloud and giving it voice. Um, and I, I only wish we had more time to hear more, um, but I'm aware that people are sweating uh, and people want their books signed. And I'd like to quickly open this up to questions from the audience. Um, please don't be shy. This is your moment to ask any questions that may have come to your mind. And we already have someone. Uh, so Alfonso will bring you the mic. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I remember being at a the last. I remember being at another book launch with Kartika and Marilyn, and and Marilyn said at that moment in that book launch, the I remember it very well. She said, "The Ghazal is a, a poetic form of which I am perhaps a little too fond," and it reminded me. I, I know Kartika's poems better, and I've always re really loved her Ghazals. And I started going, oh, am I perhaps a little too fond of Kartika's ghazals? And I noticed that here, when you mentioned this is a ghazal, you went, okay, I'm not going to go into that now. So I wondered if you might go into that now. <laughs> and it might explain why we're, why we might be a little too fond of this form. Um, uh, but the the chazal is a form that we get from uh, uh, well, uh, first of, for, uh, for, for, uh, first first of all first of all from poetry and Farsi, but it's also in which of your languages? As well, not just mine. I mean, it's uh, gone across a lot of languages in 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 South and well, in East Ur Asia. Certainly you know, Ur from no, no, Hindi and Ur Urdu Ur and even Tamar and Malaysian. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, Malay, I mean, yeah, it's it's gone across a lot of languages, and uh, uh, that had been interest in, 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 introduced in, into in, in English by uh, 
a variety of poets and even in uh, had books of poetry written by unlikely people un unlikely people uh, but it was especially the Kashmiri poet Aga, Aga Shahid Ali uh, who uh, made what he called the real Khazal uh, 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 alive uh, uh, in, um, uh, in in the English language because there were a lot of poets would I would say a lot of poets, but quite a few poets would write poets, write poems that were basically in uh, unrelated couplets that circulated around one topic and called them chazal. And in a sense, that does have something to do uh, with what the chazal is. Um, uh, but the chazal uh, also, uh, uh, the couplets of, of, of the chazal also uh, uh, involve a uh, kafia, which is a rhyme uh, that uh, which which varies uh, in uh, in each of the couplets, and a radif, um, which um, uh, is a, a, a word or phrase that is established in the first couplet and then repeated in the second uh, uh, the second line of every following couplet. So if, if that's yeah, yeah, so if, if if that answers your question. And then the poet is supposed to uh uh although there are many variations or or, or just ignoring of, of this and I know I the one I read I sort of ignored it that the poet is supposed to use uh, uh, some version or reference to uh of his or her name in the uh, in the I think in the uh, in the last line of the uh, of, of the last of, of the last couplet, uh, which is the, the and the last couplet was called the tachulus, which means the way out. As we're now on the topic of form, um, both of you work so extensively um, with the form of your poems, just to list a few of the forms that you use across your works. Um, we have the canzone, the rimas de zolutas, sonnets, sestinas, villanelles, blank verse, heroic couplets, pantoums, sonnets, gazals, and tanka, to name a few. Um, and Kartika, you've said about your use of form that forms are your weapons. And I'm interested in this relationship between the formal quality of a poem and its capacity for political engagement. So could you speak a bit more about this relationship between form and resistance in poetry? Um, well, I think the, the, the greatest thing that form gives me is structure and um, structure enables you to sort of aim, sort of reach the ear and then the head and the heart in, in very, you know, in, in very effective ways. Um, which actually is used by poetry even when it's not formal. I think even poetry, which is considered free verse, is actually playing a lot with, you know, things like refrains and and the rhythm. And and the thing that form gives you is it it uh, the combination of well, whether it's a metrical form or not, um, uh, the, the the combination of the syllabic and the rhythmic or the repetition, um, they allow you to uh, gain different. Um, different inroads, for want of a better word. So, for instance, when I was working with Until the Lions, um, that's my reworking of the Mahabharata, I was dealing with 19 voices, and I desperately needed them not to sound like me, and there's only one me, so, you know, that's kind of inevitable. So form was a real weapon in that sense, because um, what uh, the Renga we read, for instance, that's, you know, 575, five, and then a couplet of 7-7. Seven, seven. So the impact that has is very different from what you would get from... Um, from pentameter or from a sestina where you're repeating um, the end words in specific order. Um, so it's, it's, it's like music or it's like movement. The effect is very different and that allows you to, especially when I'm doing narrative poetry, it allows me to create characters. And those characters uh, vehicle something, they vehicle, even if it's fictional, which it definitely is in Until the Lions, but it's also referencing real life uh, in terms of history, et cetera. So it allows you to, um, I think, contain and therefore bristle with character or experience. It's the condensation, but it's also the sharpening. So it's a bit like sculpture um, 
or better still, I am rambling a bit, sorry. I, I think of it like architecture. What a hospital needs to do is very different from what a garden needs to do is very different from what a tomb needs to do. And that's the way I also think of form and poetry, that it gives you an internal structure, which is even when, and the reader doesn't need to know anything about it, um, Marilyn read a beautiful poem tomb, and I'm sure it hit us differently with the repetition of entire lines or variations of entire lines. The affect is also different because of what you know how it's structured. Also, it's a very good way to, uh, to uh, get the poem out of your own head. And I, I would, and now, and not only make it not not the email autobiographical, but uh, uh, also you know take it from where the the path that you your, you yourself as a writer might expect it, it, um, 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 might 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 expect it to go down, to go down and. Uh, uh, and and some it will go some it, sometimes it will just go someplace unexpected be, just because there is something that you've got to do with with words uh, 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 with, with 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 sounds with uh, 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 with meters or repetitions or or, or, or rhymes that uh, it, it it puts your mind in a place that has more to do with music than. Uh, and and you asked about the politics of it. I think, for instance, it's it's not anodyne or you know accidental that um, slogans or chants that you have in resistance movements or just protests are often you know refrains. They're often um, accidentally defined. or otherwise they're formulated around certain key words and key syllables. So you know the oral is 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 always I think yes. predominant. Yes. Um, I'd like to just finish with a, a quote I read by Marilyn today from an interview where you said that form is like the small boat that take, that's taking us across the Mediterranean. <laughs> I just think it's a lovely way to think about it. Um, and Especially if, in the current, the current <laughs> climate. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. 